Welcome everyone to the last lecture of our software product line course. The topic of today's lecture will be evolution and maintenance of software product lines. And the slides again are our collaboration together with Elias Küter and Timo Keo. My name is Thomas Thüm, Thomas for short. We've had a whole semester of uh, lectures uh, afterwards or uh, uh, behind us. Uh, we talked about ad hoc approaches to variability. We talked about how to model and implement features. We talked about quality assurance, but so far we haven't talked about the most inherent uh, that is uh, for uh, going on during software development. And this is the evolution changes to the actual software. So today we will talk about those changes and there are two common terms and changes are often distinguished in terms of whether they are evolution, some plan changes or some maintenance, something that was not maybe seen uh, beforehand. And in the last part, uh, I will give a brief course summary, summarizing what were the topics, what were the interconnections between the different topics that we've seen throughout uh, the whole course. So let's talk about product line evolution. Um, I would like to start with a quote uh, by Jimmy Koppel. Uh, Koppel. Software maintenance is important because the world runs on software and changing the world means changing the software. Uh, so we are seeing that more and more things in our world are actually controlled and supported by means of software. And if anything in the world changes, we also need to reflect that uh, by means of changes in the software. And this goes hand in hand. Um, uh, we can do changes much easier in software than in hardware, for instance. Uh, so this is uh, this is easy from this point of view, but we will also see that in the long run, uh, this is actually a very challenging task to change the software to always fulfill uh, the needs of our world. We already talked about this slide in the introductory course. We talked about Lehman's laws of software evolution. I won't go much into detail here, but Basically, the, the essence of these laws is that software that is used will be modified. So there's no way around this. If software is used uh, for uh, a certain amount of time, then it will also be modified or need to be modified. And when modified, its complexity will increase automatically, kind of. And if we don't want to, uh, to increase, then we need to actually actively work against it. And we talked about certain challenges that we see with product lines, and all these challenges are actually much more problematic. So for instance, if we look at software clones, the more uh, clone and own projects we have, the larger are the maintenance problems later on. The harder it is to merge certain, uh, certain uh, new features or changes. The harder it is to trace the features, to find all the implementation, all the artifacts of the features, um, the automated generation, so the like the, the payoff of a product line uh, is actually uh, increased. Uh, if we have automated generation, we can actually have more complex product lines, more complex products and uh, more products. Um, we do have uh, all the problems that are inherent to the uh, combinatorial explosion, because if systems get more complex if we have more features in a product line then we will also have more products more configurations and also in the end more feature interactions we've also looked at these slides in terms of the linux kernel so the linux kernel is developed with about 60,000 commits per year uh, this of of course uh, varies a bit um, uh, at which year we are looking at in peak weeks this means there's a new commit every five minutes and in average weeks uh, every nine minutes. And we also see that on the right top uh, picture that uh, a large amount of the code uh, is actually uh, very old and uh, has been there for many, uh, for a long time. And then we looked at the evolution of the Linux kernel already uh, from different angles. For instance, the lines of source code. So how many lines of source code uh, are we getting in addition? And the Linux kernel is getting more and more complex. We have about 1 million lines of code uh, added every year. This uh, brings us to 3,000 3, lines of code every day. So it is getting more complex. 
Uh, we also see this in the number of features, and this is uh, roughly 800 new features every year. So this is a very, uh, like, uh, probably the, the largest growing product line uh, that is available, software product line, uh, with about 50 new features every week. And then we can see, like, how does the number of products increase? And right now, we cannot really uh, compute uh, most recent numbers. Uh, so the problem is simply too complex to even compute how many Linux kernel configurations uh, we have, but it's likely to be more than 10 to the power of 1,500. So when we look at changes of the feature model, it's interesting to see whether we, uh, how, how does the set of products uh, change? And there's a classification um, that I came up with uh, also based on the literature in my bachelor's thesis. And uh, it's uh, commonly used uh, also by other researchers where we think of like a change to a product line in terms of, do we add new products? Do we delete products? And based on answering these two questions, we do have different situations. If no products are added and no products are deleted and all the existing products are not changed, basically, then we have a refactoring here. If we add new products but don't remove any products, then we have a generalization. So the product line uh, is able to generate more products, but all the existing products still uh, stay the same. And we have the opposite. Uh, which is a specialization of the product line where not all of the products are available anymore, only a subset of the product uh, products is available uh, afterwards, but there are no new products. And then there are also combinations of both. So in some of the cases, we might want to change all existing products or we uh, want to introduce some new uh, products and remove some others. And Interestingly, when looking at a feature model, this is something that can be reduced again to a third problem. So this is very similar to uh, what we discussed in the uh, third part of uh, the fourth lecture uh, in this lecture series. Uh, we won't go into details, but if you are interested, then you can have a look at the uh, citation over here. So why is this useful to know this classification? So once we are changing the product line. Why is it interesting to know this? So in terms of quality assurance, uh, we've had two lectures on static and dynamic quality assurance uh, already. Um, whenever we do a refactoring, there's actually no need to do quality assurance. There's no need to retest uh, the product line. Of course, this depends a bit on the notion of a refactoring sometimes. Uh, something is considered a refactoring even though it may break something so we need to make sure that uh, this is the case here but especially from from that notion no products added no products deleted no products changed uh, this also means there's no retest uh, necessary if we do have a specialization of the product line then we will not find more errors the only thing that we can do is to check whether some faults that we've had in the software product line before are now fixed. Uh, so this was one of the strategies that we've seen for uh, coping with feature interactions that we make a feature interaction explicit and forbid certain combinations. So this could be then a way to uh, see whether the feature interaction is now fixed. So it does not make sense for a specialization to look for new uh, uh, yeah, problems for new, um, for new faults because we cannot, by definition, find new faults. And the opposite is true for generalization. Uh, if we do a generalization, we will not be able to fix any of the existing products by means of our generalization, but we will have some new products and those new products need to be tested somehow. And then we have arbitrary edits and for arbitrary edit, uh, we do need some retests. Still, there could be some optimizations that not everything needs to be retested because an arbitrary edit could also mean that some of the products uh, stay the same. But there are also advantages not only for quality assurance, but also for modelers. So for people modeling a feature model, for instance, it might be helpful to see if they just want to improve 
the readability of a feature model, they want to restructure something, then it would be good for them if they have a certificate that says, yes, you did a refactoring right now, or if there's a refactoring mode that only allows to do refactoring uh, in um, an editor for a feature model, for instance. We will look at some examples. Um, and for now, we focus only on the feature model. And the idea is that we uh, are only changing the feature model and uh, we assume that all the artifacts, all the implementation of the product line stays the same and that we have an automatic generation uh, technique available. So we do have a version of a feature model here. It's very simple. It just has A, B, C, D, and E. And certain combinations are available and others are not. And we see that from the version one to version two, there has been some changes. The feature model looks different now, but actually those two feature models describe the same set of configurations. And um, but the, the feature model on the right hand side might be easier to read because it, uh, it does avoid uh, the extra constraint. It does have some more structure in there. We know that C and D probably belong to B somehow, so that B is an abstraction of C and D. So this could be an improvement of a feature model to make it more readable by, while maintaining all the product sets. But there are also other changes available. We could, for instance, um, change the feature E from mandatory to optional. And over here, we would introduce some new products. We would introduce some new products that don't have E uh, uh, selected. But we can also go to another version here, version 4, where we say, OK, this was a mistake that we did uh, change E to be an optional feature in the past. So we change it uh, back again to mandatory, but we make the features C and D optional. So we can also choose more configurations here uh, that have C and D not selected. And now we can look at what is the classification of those changes. And there's, uh, there are algorithms that can do this automatically. And they will report to us that going from version 1 to version 2 was indeed a refactoring. And going from version 2 back to version 1 would also be a refactoring. Then we have a generalization whenever going from version 1 or 2 to version 3 or 4. So independent, all the uh, four possible combinations uh, that we can go here, for instance, from version 1 to version 4. It's not easy to see from, from the diagrams, uh, but uh, in the end, we could look what are the, the possible configurations, and there will be more afterwards. And then we have a specialization, and this is basically going back. Whenever we go from version 3 or 4 back to version 1 or 2, this will be a specialization. And then we have arbitrary edits whenever we go from version 3 to 4 or vice versa. There are other possible refactorings, and there's actually a catalog of such refactorings. Uh, by Van der Alfs et al. And for instance, we could change an alternative group into an OR group with, with an additional constraints. In most cases, this is probably not much useful, but thinking of the other way around, so we would make the feature model uh, less, uh, yeah, having less constraints and probably easier uh, to maintain. There's a similar thing uh, that we can do from between all groups and optional features if we make the additional constraint explicit and something similar for mandatory to optional, but this is probably not very useful on its own. But in larger feature models, we sometimes see this, that we have something that is called false optional feature, which means there is a feature B. It's actually not optional. Whenever we have A, we also need to select B. And this doesn't need to be so explicit as in this case. It could be uh, hidden somewhere as implicit constraint in some other by means of transitivity. And here's some other examples. For instance, we could move a feature to a new parent. Uh, so over here, we move the feature C from the parent B to the parent A, or we move the feature, uh, the same feature uh, again back into the other direction. And these are uh, also uh, refactorings. But they are only refactorings because the feature B is mandatory. If it would have been optional, then this would be a different story. 
Um, this catalog that, that was presented there was uh, actually not complete. So there are more possible operations and other research focused on this uh, to make a complete set of uh, such refactorings. But then there are also generalizations, for instance, introducing a new feature to an alternative group, introducing a new optional feature into an OR group, into an existing OR group, or uh, doing the same uh, like from an alternative and an optional feature to an OR group. So you see they can uh, become quite complex or changing from alternative to an OR group. We get some more configurations, so it's a generalization, changing from N to an OR, changing from OR to optional features. We've already seen this in the previous example. And here are other examples going from mandatory to optional. And the difference to the example that we see earlier is here that no further constraint is in included here. If we would include another constraint, then it would be a refactoring, right? If we make the connection explicit between A and B. And there are further examples. And one of the examples is also to introduce a new optional feature. And introducing only a new optional feature is always a generalization. And then, of course, what we can also do is whenever we remove a constraint from the formula, this can be a generalization. But there are also cases where this could be a refactoring. So this is actually, uh, yeah, not not always the case. It depends a bit on the on the case. And again, there are more of such operations. So far, we only looked at the feature model. But it's quite interesting that not only the feature model changes, but also uh, the artifacts change. So we do not only have changes in the problem space in the feature model, but we also have changes in the solution space in the actual code artifacts, in the mapping to features, in the variability model, which like for kconfig is uh, called a variability model, but it's similar to a feature model uh, from its purpose. Um, and then we have uh, might have in conditional compilation also build system variability. So we talked about all this in detail in the lecture on conditional compilation, lecture five. And yeah, so basically the question is not only uh, what, how how do product lines evolve? Um, not only the feature models evolve, but also the source code changes, the mapping from features to source code changes. Uh, this is known as co-evolution. So there are different artifacts. They co-evolve. They do not evolve independently, but kind of together. So if I'm introducing a new feature, then I'm not only adding this to the feature model, but I'm also adding this to the source code or to the build scripts. So for conditional combination, this means we can change the feature model, we can change build scripts, we can change the source code. And the question is, how frequent are those changes? And that's what I want to show you, which what is also done in this study, which is linked up here. And of course, you can press a link in this video, but you can open the slides down uh, linked below the video. What is interesting for all these three kinds of artifacts is that uh, the variability information evolves. So kind of the mapping from features to artifacts, but also artifact specific information evolves. And we can see this in all those three different kinds. Uh, let's look only at the code example. In the code example, we do have some variability information. So for instance, a new else construct is added here. This influences how the mapping looks like it influences the mapping of this particular line afterwards. And this is basically an artifact specific information that we are changing here. And the distinction is interesting because whenever we only change artifact specific information, it's only indirectly related to variability. Whereas if we change also the variability information, then it probably has a larger impact on uh, the kind of the combinatorics on uh, also on different uh, test techniques that we would need to apply. So the question is, how frequent are those changes? And there has been a large empirical study on this, um, where they found out that that the la largest amount of changes is actually only changing um, artifact specific information. So this means we are changing the source code for the product line, but we are only changing Java statements if it's a Java product line or C uh, statements if it's a C product line. 
And there's only a, a smaller portion um, where only the variability information is changed. And there are like uh, the, the more reasonable case is like uh, uh, or something between those two uh, dimensions is typically that we change both variability and artifact specific information. And there's a more detailed view even because we now have uh, two dimensions here that we can distinguish between uh, because we have two uh, three different kinds of artifacts. We do have uh, commits changing uh, something in model artifacts, so which is uh, the last letter here, uh, and build artifacts and also code artifacts. And uh, we can see that most of the changes are actually happening to source code. But when looking into this, uh, these changes in source code, we can see that uh, for Linux, 79% of the changes only change the source code and not the mapping from features to source code. And there are 87% uh, of the commits change the source code together, po potentially together with the variability information in there. So out of uh, 10 commits, uh, eight commits are only changing the source code, only changing, for instance, C uh, when, we when it comes to Linux. So it's interesting that only 1% of the commits in Linux only changes the feature model. There are 4% of commits that actually change the feature model. Uh, this might look low, but if you consider that like a feature model is something that we create the feature model during domain analysis, and then we use this for years, this is basically not happening in practice because there are frequent changes also to the feature model and not only to the source code. And if you remember the previous diagrams where we said there are 15 features, new features every week, then uh, and uh, yeah, a certain number of commits every week, then uh, obviously there are also a couple of changes uh, every week on the feature model itself. Uh, yeah, uh, less frequent are changes to the build scripts. So this is uh, like only the coarse grain variability and this changes to this coarse grain variability are not so frequent and most of the changes are actually happening in the source code. Of course, uh, these values vary if we look at other systems, but the general picture is that most of the changes only affect the source code or the mapping of source code to artifacts and there's a lower amount of changes that change the feature model. So what are the lessons learned from the first part of this lecture? Changes in are uh, inevitable. Uh, that's true for any software, so also for software product line, and they occur frequently. And you could even argue that software product lines need to evolve even more frequently than a single system, because just if if anything changes for a single customer, for a single configuration, then we still need to change the product line. So, uh, and that's something that we see that product lines even uh, evolve at a higher pace with more commits uh, or uh, more changes, uh, as we can see for Linux. The product lines typically grow over time. So they grow in the number of features, they grow in lines of code, they grow in the number of products. So they're getting more complex. There are different kinds of changes to feature models, for instance, refactorings, and we can use this information in quality assurance, but also to understand whether the changes that we've applied to a feature model are producing the uh, expected output. And not only feature models are changed, but also the feature mapping and the artifacts. Uh, this some for the reading. Uh, you've seen the pointers already in the previous slides. And you could think about, after which changes do we need to analyze and test the product line again? So what are the potential changes to feature model, feature map and artifacts where there's maybe no need to retest anything? So think about this. Um, I hope you enjoyed this part and hope to see you back in the next part.